Before we can run our own master server and facilitator, we need to get the source code from the Unity 3D website and build it for our target platform. I'm going to demonstrate this on the Linux server provided by our web hosting company because it shows some of the issues that you may run into when you build the master server and facilitator for your target platform. So let's get set up to build the master server on our target platform. We start by going to the website at unity3d.com where the master server source code is stored. I could download the source code archives and then manually move them to the target server. But instead, I'm going to log into the server and then download the source code directly to the target server. So first I'm going to open a terminal. And then I'm going to connect to the web host server. Now that I'm connected to the server, I'm going to create a new directory to store the files that I download in. And I'll change directory so now I'm in that directory. Since I'm going to download both the master server and the facilitator, I'm going to create another set of subfolders. Okay, now that I'm located to the folder where I want to download the source code for the master server, I need to get the URL. I can do that by right clicking and selecting copy link. Then I can go back to the terminal and use the wget, which is webget, paste the URL that I copied and that downloads the master server source code. Now that I have the master server source code, I want to repeat this for the facilitator source code. Once again, I need to copy the URL by right clicking and choosing copy link. And then use the web get followed by the URL to download the source code for the facilitator. So now we have two folders, one for the facilitator and one for the master server. The facilitator, by the way, is the thing that provides the NAT punch through capability. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about NAT punch through other than to say it's a method of allowing two machines to communicate when they're behind a firewall, which is now the rule rather than the exception for Wi-Fi networks in homes. I'll also mention that cellular network carriers don't support NAT punch through. So using the master server for a smartphone based game is probably not the best option. Luckily, there are other options that we can use that work with cellular networks. So let's get ready to build these servers for our target platform. We'll start with the master server. I'm going to unzip the archive, creates all of these files, and then I'll repeat the process of unzipping for the facilitator. And once again, we have the unzipped source code. Because both the facilitator and the master server use the RackNet libraries, I'm going to copy it to a common location and point both the master server and the facilitator to that common location. So first I'm going to move it back one directory level. Now I'm going to create a link, which is the Linux equivalent to an alias that points back to the folder that I just moved. Now I'm going to repeat this for the master server. Now, because I already have a copy of the RackNet folder, I don't need to copy it again here. I'm just going to delete the RackNet folder and make that link or alias back to it. This is the Linux command to remove a folder and all of its contents. And now I'm going to make the link back again. Okay, now that I've moved the RackNet code to a common location, I'm ready to build the servers. Let's start by building the master server simply by running the make file. You'll notice some warnings. It's very common in open source software to see warnings like this. And you can just simply ignore them. Okay, it's finally done. The master server has been successfully built. Now let's repeat the process for the facilitator. It'll build a little more quickly because the RackNet libraries have already been compiled and they're in that common place. Once again, we change to the directory and then we type make to build it on Linux. Okay, much faster because as I said, RackNet had already been built. You can now see the facilitator has been successfully built. So we've downloaded the source code, we built it, we're ready to run it. Let's see what happens when we run this on our Linux server. It fires up and it crashes. Well, let's take a look at the master server. Of 
So the master server runs, but the facilitator crashes. We've hit our first issue and we need to fix it. And the reason for this crash is that our web host provider uses a cloud service that has more IP addresses than RackNet software is able to handle. There are a lot of different ways we could fix this. For the purpose of expediency, we're going to hack the code so that it supports just the IP address that's assigned to our host name, burningthumb.com. So I've done some investigation and I know the problem is in the RackNet software in the socketlayer.cpp file. So let's open that up in an editor. I also know where I need to make the change. Okay, this is the code that has the problem. It essentially loops through all of the IP addresses, adding them to a table. And what's happening is that table is overflowing because it's too small for all of the IP addresses on this host. So we're going to replace this code with a piece of code that looks just for the IP address for our burningthumb.com host. So I've jumped ahead a bit here and I've already put the code in, but you can see here's the hack alert just so people know that it's hacked. This is where we get the host record for burningthumb.com. This is where we get the IP address for that host record. And now we compare to make sure that the IP address that we're gonna to add to the table matches the IP address for that host name. So let's rebuild the software. And now let's run the facilitator again. And this time you see it just displays our IP address and the server starts successfully. So now we have both a facilitator and a master server that are built for and run on our target Linux platform.